has been practicing in the industry for the past 80 plus years. What has happened since 1921, and we'll talk about the history of the 1031 exchange, it has evolved into more processes. But the concept is the same. Sell a relinquished property, find a replacement property. But there have to be a way to do that. Everything about it in this class for the next few hours. We're gonna go into so many examples, case studies, transactions that I have done, what has happened in the marketplace over the past 10 years. But welcome. How about you? Yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, good to see you again. Hi, Hugo. Yeah. Um, so my, my dad's a real estate uh, agent in Florida, and he's been doing that for 15 years or so. Um, so everybody online, so they, they, let's pause one moment, and so everybody can hear what they're saying. So you and her, you have that in common, that your parents all are also in real estate. So you're like the next generation already, you know? of learning more about the business and the industry. So I'm happy to, to hear that and I'm excited for you guys and for everybody online as well. We're gonna be learning so much today. Continue. Uh, yeah, he um, was a broker for some like high net worth individuals and he kind of goes through the 10 one exchange process quite a lot. Um, so I picked up some pieces here and there from the process and, and yeah. Great, I wanna tell you that um, the process and the techniques. First, we have to learn about the fundamentals. And we're gonna go into all the details about that. And then you're gonna start, as you learn more about the process and the fundamentals, you're gonna start learning about and formulating your mind, how I can some strategies to upgrade my properties to bigger buildings, more units, better quality of, of location as well. So welcome. What year are you in? Senior. Senior? Sophomore. sophomore. So the sophomore senior uh, in the class. Okay. Uh, anybody online who wants to chime in and uh, make comments, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we'll go online. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Peyton. I'm a Peyton. junior. Junior. And I kind of got interested in this because both my parents do some investing with multifamily homes in two different companies out of Colorado. So I haven't done any personal investments with them, but I've seen a little bit of the projects they've worked on and I've learned about some of the companies that they've worked with. This is your parents, you're saying? My parents, yeah. Got they, it. they both invest in the same two companies. Oh, um, everybody online, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, Peyton, but this is uh, what's happening in the industry right now that real estate is a hot topic, you know? And many students want to learn more about it. They want to learn how to raise capital. They want to learn from professionals like myself. I've been in the industry for more than 15 years. Plus, you have the connection with your parents, your family members, who can also support you in that idea to learn more about it. So I'm excited to hear that too. So you have in common with Hugo, and what's your first name again? Sophie. Sophie. So we're going to see if anybody else online can connect with you guys as far as your background. But continue what you're saying. Yeah. Hi, welcome. Um, so I've done some, some investor. I've looked at some of the investments they've made and kind of which projects they've worked with that have done well and haven't done well. Yeah. I've gotten a little bit of kind of brief analysis of why it's happened. Yeah. I'm brand new to 1031 exchanges. So this is new material to me. And I'm oh my God. I love that. Good to, uh, to learn a little bit or not at all because from this moment on, you can evolve into strategies. Everything you're going to be learning in this seminar, you can apply that tomorrow, by the way. And I'm going to try to explain to you guys very clearly the process, the fundamentals, and all the benefits. Over the past like 10 years, I have developed a model on how to identify properties, the benefits, and the characteristics that you can follow to make that transaction happen. You know? But uh, thank you for your comments. We're talking about your background in real estate, and if you can uh, tell us your name and the connection to real estate, if you have any. Uh, my name is Andrea. Hi. Hi, I'm an accountant, um, master, master program, master program, accounting. Yeah, and I have just recently started buying real estate. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so I'm just trying to learn more about it. My goodness. Yeah. Excellent. Welcome. 
So all of you guys have that in common that you do have some experience either through your parents, through your family, or owning property yourself. You know, so that's, that's I'm excited about that. Okay, so can we uh, put so much light. Uh, uh, okay, so anybody wants to make comments online or uh, ask questions, you can interrupt me anytime. Actually, we just got one. Yeah. Uh, we have Carla, who is a CPA and Master's of Tax grad student, interested in 1031s, due to the tax benefits for her clients. Okay, so what's the question that she had? It's not a question, she was just introducing herself. Okay, great. So welcome, uh, Carla. Uh, so Carla is a CPA, Master's of Tax grad students interested in 1031 exchange due to the tax benefit of, for my clients. You're gonna learn so much in this class and you're gonna pretty much formulate strategies for your clients to defer those taxes and sometimes forever for the next generation. So we're gonna do it, of course, legally. We're gonna do it the right way. And you guys are gonna learn all about that. So welcome, Carla. This is gonna be our agenda today. First, we're gonna talk about the intersection of real estate, entrepreneurship, and financial and engineering. So your master's, uh, in accounting, is that where you're going right now? Your, mm -hmm. your class? Okay, how about you? Which is your major today? Finance. Finance, yeah. how about you? Marketing. Marketing? Uh, business management. Business management, okay. And online, uh, any comments about your background? Uh, okay, so we have, uh, can you read that one for me? Yeah. Well, Carla's in the master program with me. <laughs> oh, she is? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Carla, what's your name again? Yeah, Andrea. Andrea, Andrea, say hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so this is from I don't want to mispronounce. I think Brazilian Powell. Brazilian uh, Powell. Hi, Brazilian. Three E law student investing in the near future, and that's why they're here. Okay, welcome. Thank you. So we're interacting a little bit, we're taking baby steps to connect the class with Zoom, Zoom with the class. So this is great. So my bridge is uh. Carla and you. Yeah. Great. So you see if you anybody anybody see anyone that you uh, recognize, just uh, let me know. I'll be great. Okay. The reason why I love what I love in the in my industry and in my uh, sector of 1031 exchange is because of my background. My background is financial engineering, but my heart is, I have a spirit of entrepreneurship mentality and I love going to work every day. So I set up my company in Torrance and I've been there over the past 15 years. Many years ago, when I graduated from, the, uh, from school from LMU, I had to make a decision to take a route to go work with someone or open my own company. And it's a big decision to make that. I decided to go on my own. You really have to believe in yourself to do that. Sometimes it's good to go and explore, go work for a company, a big outfit, for instance, your parents, what they did. And I, and I support that as well. The reason why I have this slide here is because you have to be true to yourself, you know, about your skill set and things that you like. And you have to make sure that you are in the right industry and it connects with who you are as well. Because I, my, for a living, I, it's, it's my passion. It's, I really enjoy what I do. And you can see here the slide that I, I made a comment about real estate investments. I always wanted to get into real estate. My family as well is in real estate. My father was an uh, engineer. So I learned all the finance aspect of the, uh, of the business. So doing a 1031 exchange and learning more about it, it was, it was like an easy fit for me. You know, um, I found this niche in the market what I needed to do in my life. 
So if you can connect to one of those three circles here, this is the place for you, I wanna tell you. And I feel that you guys can connect with that. What's your first name again? Sophie. Sophie, can you read the first, the first one on the top? If you know what? Right. Can you read the second one? Fostering a superior spirit, driver for growth. Right. And the next one? Financial engineering achieves investment value add by ability, reducing financing costs, increasing cash flow, and unlocking enjoyment. So basically, the message there is that you can be passionate about something, right? But you really need to learn how to go about it. If you have a business background, if you have your financial engineering background, if you have your accounting background, you know, your finance background, this is the place for you because you can use all that skill set that you are developing here at LMU and take that skill set in the workplace, in the industry. And at the same time, if you have that entrepreneurial mentality and spirit that we talk about here, driving for growth and opportunity, then you can really, really make tons of wealth in your lifetime. I can assure you of that. Imagine this, right? When you see all these buildings here in Playa Vista, somebody owns those properties. Maybe a group of investors, maybe a syndication, maybe one person. But can you imagine that person who purchased that 100 unit building, that 50 unit building? That shopping center has like 20 stores in different locations. They started somewhere. But keep in mind, right? If you don't have that spirit, if you don't believe in yourself, you cannot take that leap, that step, right? So, this is so important to me, you know? I created this slide right in the beginning of our presentation because I can, myself, I connect with this. And I can tell you that if you connect with these three points, three, these three pillars, let's call them pillars, you know, then you are going to be super successful in the industry. And let me point out something else to you that there are many investors that I represent that perhaps 60% of your life is in real estate and the rest, they may be doing something else. Some of them, they, they get 100% into, into doing real estate investments, but you don't have to do it 100%. You know, you can allocate the time. So it's not to feel connected to these three pillars. You know, it's, I'm excited about that. I made this slide to give a little history about my background and how I can connect those three pillars to the decision that I made many years ago. When I graduated from school, I had to make a decision to go work with somebody or just have my own company. So what I decided to do was purchase my office building. And keep this in mind that during that time, that financial engineering skill set, it was not as developed as now. But I, I had that spirit. I wanted to get started in the business. But personally, I didn't want to go and lease a space for my office of doing the thing. So what did I do? I applied for an SBA loan. How did I raise the capital? This is one way that everybody online can learn and can apply this right away. How to raise capital besides reaching out to your friends, to reaching out to your family members. If you really want to exponentially increase that capital that you have, this is one way to do it. If you start doing transactions. In my situation, what I did was I earned commission on three separate transactions. So I saved that money. So I saved that money to put a, a down payment in that purchase of that property that I wanted to do. 
But at first, I wanted to, I needed to get a loan. So I don't know how the bank qualify me, but sometimes it's, a, it's amazing that you can, uh, you can be an expert in financial statements. You can generate and formulate projections you know, on your statements, but you have to be able to interpret, sell it. All those reports that you make, you have to be able to interpret those reports and make people excited. So that's, that's what I did. I got assistance from my family to help me formulate some financial statements, some projections, because when you apply for an SBA loan, they ask you so many questions and there's so many forms that you have to follow. But after you put all that together, that package together, and apply for an SBA loan, you have to go present yourself. And so that's what I did. Like I said to you, I don't know how they accepted my, 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 uh, my loan application, but they did. So what I did with that money, as you can see here, the loan that I got, it was tied to the Wall Street Journal. It's a, an adjustable loan. But at that time, I didn't care what kind of loan I wanted to get. I just wanted to get the loan to purchase that building. So this is where my office is, downtown Torrance. I've been there ever since then. And I'm very proud to say that when I do my business, my clients come to my office and it feels good to know that you own the property where your business is. It's, 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 a, it's a, such a rewarding feeling. You can duplicate that into whatever investments that you are interested in. I wanna get a feel of you guys and also online. What type of real estate would you like to invest in just to get a feel of what your mindset is so we can, if you can share your ideas with, with me and everybody online. Ladies first. Um, I currently own multi-family. So you own multi-family? Yeah. How many units? Uh, three. Three units, a triplex. And I wanna get into, uh, I'm a commercial. Commercial? So you wanna, uh, explore or from residential to commercial mm -hmm. great awesome and by the way commercial generally speaking in the industry um, more than five units one to four units and the reason one to four units they they consider that as a not a commercial loan is because the lenders make those decisions you know any loan that you're going to get at the bank most banks they will consider a commercial loan when it's more than five units so keep that in mind Thank you for sharing. I would also say commercial. Commercial? And in your mind, when you say commercial, what's in your mind about commercial? Uh, just like larger, multi-family, probably apartment building. Okay. The ones that I like invested in now that my dad's worked with are, I forget the exact number, but like a couple hundred units. Yeah. So that's probably the goal. Yeah, and uh, I'm telling you, uh, and we'll get to more details about uh, the cycle that just happened uh, in 2008. And the, the cycle that we're living right now, the corrections in the market, you know, we'll talk about it in detail. But generally speaking, multifamily has been the calling child of the industry, you know, either because there's more demand for rentals or because the interest rates in the past two, three, four years, they were low exactly. So it would make the values go up, you know, that was what's called cap rate compression. But we'll talk about that also. Uh, thank you for sharing. So we have two students uh, today who are uh, very experienced. They want to get into multifamily, more than 20, 30, 50 units. And they do have some background on that. And also we have a student who owns a triplex and they want to get into commercial more units. Am I correct? Yeah. Thank you. How about you? Uh, yeah, I would say commercial real estate has been uh, doing it for a long term for me, but I would say starting off, uh, you know, one to three units with the family um, complexes. So. so we have one to three units? Yeah. Okay. Are you interested in uh, three units, meaning three condos, three houses, or a triplex like your uh, colleague here? What do you think? Yeah, probably a triplex. Like a triplex? Yeah. Okay. So a triplex is a good decision, everybody online as well, because triplex, what you can do is you can apply for a loan and live in one of the units. So the loan that you would apply, it'll be a primary residence loan, a loan on an occupied. So the rate will be lower. 
investment versus an investment loan. So that's excellent way you thought about. It. How about you? Yeah, I'd like to get into either commercial or especially mixed use. Mixed use. Um, I'm trying to take a couple other courses that are about like more urban planning and zoning. Yeah. Because it just pertains really well with mixed use properties. And yeah. How it's kind of all in one and you can create several communities. Uh, mixed use property is 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 an exciting industry as well. Subsector of the market, you know. And uh, so you have your retail on the first level, and then you have your condos or townhomes on the second level. Mixed use is excellent. Also, uh, also something to keep in mind is that the zoning as well, you know. And uh, you can learn everything that you're talking about in the other sessions that we're gonna um, have through the program. But uh, mixed use, uh, I'm excited about that as well. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Okay. Can I actually share as well? Um, yes. So I think a lot of us have said like commercial and a lot of us have said residential. Um, but I recently learned that there's a lot of money to be made, not only in industrial, which is the, but also in the entertainment world, somebody has to pay for all these filming lots. And people have to rent out the space to use that. And I just started learning about them this week, but I think that it can be really lucrative and something to consider. Yeah, I'm still I agree with you on that. Actually, um, real estate is all about supply and demand, you know? That's what you're talking about. Follow that demand because that's that's where you can make the money there. I agree with you. Yes. I'm kind of interested in parking lots too. Parking lots. <laughs> By the way, if you only knew my preferences, that's my top two. Parking lots. Why do you are you interested in parking lots? I feel like the maintenance involved. You got it. And let, let me tell, let me just remind you. Parking lots, maintenance low. When you do it, all your financials, you know, recurring expenses, that's gonna be like less than 20%. You know, I agree with you. Go ahead. And then just the rate that they charge now, like to go to a game at USC, it's like $100 to park. Yeah. Park. Yeah. And it's so subjective. Plus, you can just, you don't have to hire that much personnel. Right. Right. I agree with you. Awesome. Can uh, Carla, um, I want to hear, can we uh, put Carla? Uh... Yeah, so Carla says that she'd be interested in commercial property and specifically a building with six to 10 units and a property that businesses can rent, maybe four business spaces that I can put my business in one and rent out the others. Yeah. Can she uh, Carla me? knows what she's doing. Can you chime in online, uh, Carla? I don't know if we can unmute people. Yeah. Uh, Carla, can you unmute yourself if you don't mind? Well, Carla's vision. Hi, Carla. Yeah, hi, Carla. Hi. I, I love the vision that you have, and I need you to share with us because that vision that you have is the vision that I had when I purchased my office building. I want to tell you, I want to connect with you. That vision that you have is love. So please share with all of us your comments, and, and I'm excited about to hear your comments. Well, so I have a small tax business I'm starting on the side. I still have my normal nine to five job, um, but I it's very hard to have the office in my house. I want a separate business um, space, um, but I like the thought of also owning property. I'm in San Pedro and they're really trying to revitalize downtown San Pedro and my dream would be to be able to buy some of those old, an old building down there and revitalize it and, and put my business in one and then rent out some other spaces so it can kind of offset the cost a little. Um, there are some great mixed use ones where you kind of have residential and business in the same kind of unit. And I liked that because I think it helps diversify the income a little bit. Yes. Um, so that that was my thought. Yeah, by the way, um, I'm extremely familiar with San Pedro. I just uh, closed uh, two escrows in San Pedro over the past few months. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, 1819 Cabrillo, Cabrillo close to Gaffey. Yeah. You know, yeah. That area. Uh, it's a, uh, let's see, west, I uh, know, it's uh, west of uh, of Gaffey. Uh -huh. So I highly believe if you're, if you're familiar with San Pedro on Gaffey, the end of Gaffey, if you can acquire any of those properties, I mean, it doesn't matter where you get, because there's going to be so much, it's huge demand in the next couple of years, I can assure you of that. So I something for you to keep in mind, 
If you can acquire something that that area with Cabrillo is Gaffy, uh, are you familiar with uh, why San Pedro, by the way? Well, I live here, so I'm not too far. I'm like tenth, a few blocks above Gaffy. So, um, and, and it's where I've grown grown up, and I just kind of have an affinity for it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, uh, you you said the word affinity. That's so important because you, all of you, as a entry level investor or perhaps uh, more experienced, like some of the students here in class, it's important also to determine what type of uh, investor you want to be, how much risk adverse you want to be, you know? And so that is connected to those pillars that we talk about, that spirit of entrepreneurship spirit to see if you want uh, to um, buy and leverage more and, and get some more loans to purchase more property. It's always important for you to stay to keep your vision straight as far as what you want to purchase, you know? And do you want to purchase property close to where you live or you want to explore out of state or out of the country, you know? So it's so important to determine that in your mind as far as uh, where you take your, your investments. Um, but thanks for your comments, Carla. Um, I have one student that just came in and uh, I want to get your background also in real estate and the connection that you have and, and why you're interested in, uh, in the industry. Let's hear from you. What's your name? I'm Robert. Hi, Robert. I'm a sophomore in finance. Master's in Software, finance, and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Welcome. So you already fill out those two pillars that we talked about. You know, the third one is uh, if, uh, if you have that financial engineering, which you do, and then if you're interested in real estate investment, which you do, so you are at the right time, at the right place today. Welcome, Martini. Thank you. Um, I don't know, I've always been interested just in mostly residential and uh, real estate, but I want to learn more about um, the commercial side of things. I've always been interested in like the hotel industry also. Wow, hotel. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my second top priority, by the way. <laughs> First one was a uh, parking lot hotels. Yeah, it's uh, it's another market, you know, but uh, it's evolving into. There's so many changes going on in that industry, uh, but we're gonna today we're gonna say for the one exchange. But that's a that's a good vision that you have. Yeah. So it's good to know the vision that you have to stay to what you like. You know, so keep that around. Well, yeah. So I'm just trying to learn as much as I can. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. So let's see here. Uh, we have uh, online Henry Ransom, interested in industrial. Can we uh, unmute? Can you unmute yourself, Henry? Hey, yeah, sorry. Hey, Henry. You know, uh, I'm also biased about industrial and I want to give you a feedback why industrial and introduce yourself by the way to everybody. Uh, you're here in, uh, uh, at LMU and uh, what are you, uh, what's your major? Uh, Henry Franson, uh, I'm actually a, a econ major with a marketing minor. Um, I am uh, honestly just with seeing like big wave with like Amazon and how many where mainly like warehouses and stuff? I feel like it's something that uh, I can really dive into. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean that's, that's there's so much demand in that industry. You know, industrial is uh, uh is another industry that uh, you can learn a lot and you can do a lot. You can do ten thirty one exchange. You can exchange from a commercial to industrial, from industrial to commercial. You know, and we'll we'll get into more details. But uh, but thanks for your comments. I love where your head is. Okay, let's continue. So today, how do you um, create wealth? Investors are freeing up the equity in their investment properties using 1031 exchange. So equity is, raise your hand, anybody knows, can you make your comments about equity? What's equity? Go ahead. Equity? Yeah. Equity is like how much um, of the property that you actually own yourself and then the rest is either own value through ownership of a loan or 
investors? Yeah, so basically, you know, if uh, the property, whatever the property is worth, and you have a loan, you can do an evaluation. And what's the difference will be your equity, you know? So what's been happening before 2022, 2021, 2020, is that there has been so much equity appreciated in real estate, multifamily, industrial, commercial, that many of my investors were doing lots of 1031 exchanges because as you know, in the past year and a half, the rates, the interest rate have gone down so much. And so the value of these properties have increased exponentially. So on paper, right? On paper. So that's what a lot of investors have been doing over the past few years, pulling that equity out, getting that equity out and purchasing another property. So that's why 1031 change is an ideal time to do it. And that's the reason why investors are doing 1031 exchange. Why me? Real estate investors have enjoyed a sizable increases in valuation over the years to that point that I'm telling you right now. That's what your triplex. How many years ago did you purchase that triplex? Two years ago. Two years ago. I can assure you that in 2021, if you would have valued that triplex in January in 2021, and value that same property in December, it had appreciated at least like 15, 20% at a minimum, even without raising rents because of the interest rate were down. You know? But right now, we're, we're, it's a different cycle. You know, we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. What's happening now in the industry? Rental prices swelled during the first half of 2022. There's a, a handout. Uh, does everybody have this handout, this report? from like two weeks ago. 13.4% increase compared to the same period in 2021. The average rent now went up to 24.95 in the US, went up 13.4%. So the demand for housing has increased. Rental prices rising, these cap rates are on the rise as well. Cap rates are also on the rise. So it's, it's, this point is very important. We start thinking about 1031 exchanges, thinking about, should I sell this property to buy a replacement property? Why should I do that? And we'll, we'll talk about the benefits of doing that. Welcome. This is a wake up call for everybody. This slide here. And this is the beginning of that correction that happened in 2022. There you go. You're in the front. Uh, can you read the dates that you see on the basis point? This is the, the rate hikes that the feds have done not over the past two, three years, not over the, the past half a year. This, this is, has been doing in the past year. In the past year, the Fed subjectively made a decision to increase rates. Look at the days that they made that decision. It's, it's, it's amazing. This is why there's a correction. This is one of the reasons there's a correction in the market. We talked about prices appreciating in 2021, 2020. This is one of the reasons why there's a correction in the market. You know. So can you read the dates? Yeah, so March 17th. What happened on March 17th? Increased by 25. 25 basis points. So if somebody, you know, the rates, they get adjusted. The lenders are, according to their guidelines, they use this to raise rates. Okay, how about the next one? And then May 5th, less than two months later, increased another 50 basis points. I mean, think about this one. From May, from March to May, two months, right? So if you were gonna purchase a property in March and you haven't found something, and then you wanna get a loan, what happened in May? The rate went up again. Continue the next day. And then June 18th, 
It went up another 75 basis points. June 18, another 75. And we're talking about the same year. We're talking about a few months ago. You know, this is this is the reality of what's going on right now. Okay. Continue. And just over a month later, July 27, it increased another 75 points. Got it. Continue. Uh, September 21st, it increased another 75 points. And then finally, yesterday? What day is today? The same fourth. What day is today? November 4th, right? Yesterday. This happened yesterday. 75 basis points. It went up. Yeah, go ahead. You can take some to her. Yeah, thank you. So six, six times, right? Look at this. Six times. And what's the reason they're doing this? Can you read what it says on the bottom here? Uh, That's the idea behind, right? But this class is about 1031 exchange. But I just want you guys to put in perspective what's happening in the market today. The reason why they're raising rates, they're raising the rates, is because they want to tamper inflation. Perhaps it's going to happen, perhaps not, but that's the intent. What's going to happen next year? They're going to keep doing this. Perhaps maybe the first quarter of next year, and after that, maybe it's going to level off. But it's so important as an investor to have that in your in your perspective, you know, because. This is going to be your first cycle in your lifetime as an investor, in, let's say in the next 30, 40 years of your investment life cycle. This is going to be the first time that you are, are going to experience this. So you have to be true to yourself to see your vision, what you want to do with your investments. So nobody knows if this is going to happen again in the future, but this is a good point of reference of something that could happen, you know? So when you start making those decisions, you know, what type of loan I'm gonna get, what's available in the market, what type of proper, property I want to exchange. So this is something good to keep in mind. Okay, so we're gonna learn some terminology today about 1031 exchange. And before I do that, I have one new guest today. So what's your name? I'm sorry. Lisa, pleased to meet you. Can you uh, tell us uh, your background, your real estate, why real estate, and what year are you at school? All of us will all share uh, our background. Okay. Um, I'm a sophomore. Sophomore? And I own a Benigado University. Okay. Um, interested, so I feel like Lisa, I'm not trying to be excited for your yeah. receipt. I'm December, I'm going to be interested around one of those students. So you're interested in real estate, but no experience in real estate, correct? Yeah. So, and there's a lot of people online as well, students that connect with you as well, you know? So welcome. If you had the opportunity to purchase real estate, someone who doesn't have any background in real estate, what type of real estate would you like to purchase? I think uh, residential. Commercial? Yeah. Okay. So commercial is more attractive versus uh, residential? versus a house, you would like to get perhaps a shopping center, perhaps a multifamily property, apartment building as well, yeah. perhaps a parking lot, perhaps an industrial property. So there's so much that you can learn today, you know, so welcome. So who's the exchanger? The exchanger is you. When you own property and you want to execute a 10 to one exchanger, exchange, you're going to be called exchanger. So that's who you are. The investor is the exchanger. The relinquished property. Relinquished property is the property that you're going to be selling. Property that you own, you're going to be selling. In our industry, we call that relinquished property. So it's not about, I'm going to sell that house, my house, my property. This is the terminology that we use in the market. Relinquished property. Replacement property is that replacement property, the property you're gonna replace that property you're gonna be selling, right? So a relinquished property, replacement property, you know? Capital gains. Can you do the honors and you read uh, the first one, capital yeah. gains? The long-term capital gain rate is 20% one-seven. 
capital gain taxes are triggered when an investor sells an asset for a higher price than its acquisition cost. So basically, the capital gains is that extra profit, you know, that you would have to pay if you don't invest. So if you sell your chocolate and you don't reinvest that money, you have to pay capital gains on that gain, on that profit. So what's that rate? 20%. It's a lot of money. And we're not, we're going to get a slide that's going to shock all of us because 20% is just one eighth of all that taxes that you we need to pay. Okay. Lot hand properties. Can you do the honors to read that one? To qualify for a section 1031, an exchanger must acquire property that is like kind to relinquish property. Keep this in mind. Like kind is just the property where you are going to be exchanging and everybody online, you're going to be exchanging the value of one property to another. So you can go from residential to commercial, from commercial to industrial, four units to 20 units. Or I have seen some investor go from an apartment building to 10 condos. You can do that. So like kind. It doesn't have to be the exact the same type of uh, building where you are going to be exchanging is value. Value, keep that in mind, value, value, value. It's not about the property itself. It's more about the value of that property. So this, this, this is super important. So as long as it's equal or more. Correct. As long as it's equal or more value. And we're gonna get into so much details about that right now, but we're, we're just scratching the surface right now before we go deep. You know? Very important for you guys to know all this uh, basic terminology because like kind is a term that is misused and now it's not going to be misused by you guys anymore it's going to be the value that you're going to be exchanging okay let's read the next one into the order okay the next one is the value any consideration an exchanger received as a part of an exchange that is not like kind to relinquish property so cash or mortgage. <clears throat> so for instance, you sold a property for let's say 500,000, you know, and you had a loan of 400,000. So that leaves you 100,000 left or gain. In that. Let's say that property didn't have a loan, 500,000, and then you're gonna replace a property worth 400,000 and you want to keep 100,000 for yourself, that's a boot. So that's subject to capital gains. So like kind. So when you decide to make a 1031 exchange, it is mandatory, mandatory that once you sell that property, you cannot touch that money because the moment that you touch that money, money, it triggers capital gains tax. Okay. So that example I just gave you, that five hundred thousand. Let's say if it's all cash, you sold that property, and then you're gonna be finding another a replacement property for the same value or more. That money has to go to an accommodator, a third party. That person has to be connected to that sales proceeds, the money that you're going to be making on that property. They're going to be holding the funds on your behalf. So the accommodator is going to be hold the fund, holding the funds. You have to do sign an exchange agreement. So the accommodator is gonna, you're gonna empower the accommodator to act on your behalf. So there has to be a, an exchange agreement signed between you, the seller, and the accommodator. Because you are gonna empower the accommodator to hold the funds on your behalf. 
when you go find that property, that replacement property, the accommodator is going to purchase that property on your behalf. And we're going to talk about the fundamentals of doing the exchange. Uh, Chris, uh, what does Chris say? Oh, that's me. I just told you that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the basics. And this is the terminology that we use investors. Why we make decisions to exchange properties. And when you compare the value of property, this is the terminology that you always use. So you have your NOI, your cap rates, your GRM, your IRR, and NPV. Cap rates, um, can somebody uh, tell me what is cap rate? Can you read uh, that slide if you don't mind? Cap rate? Yeah, uh, so the NOI provided by the market value is the cap rate. Um, the mortgage or debt service are not included in operating expenses to calculate the NOI. It's also correlated to risk and use to evaluate the probability of an investment and performance of the current property against the property. So basically, investors, what we do is we compare cap rates versus one property and another property. Most of the time, we use these two matrix, the cap rate and the GRM. Cap rates, basically, the formula is you have your gross income minus expenses or vacancies. That's if you're, your NOI, your net operating income. It's a very basic formula that is going to stay with you forever. So this formula is like a, your best friend. If you ever want to do an exchange, if you want to exchange multifamily, you have to, in your mind, you have to do this in your sleep. So once again, it's your gross income minus your expenses and your vacancies, and that's going to give you your, your net operating income. So what do you do with that NOI? You are going to divide it by the value of that property. And that's going to give you that rate. So it can be 3%, 3.5, 4%, 4.5, 5%, 5.5. So it's super important for you guys to learn this concept, this formula. Cap rate. Cap rate is used to evaluate the profitability of investments and the performance of the current property. So you can compare one investment versus another investment. It's such a basic formula. And you really can get more sophisticated as far as making models connected to cap rates. And that's what I have done in the past 10 years to connect properties and, and compare properties based on cap rates. And then sometimes I do it based on GRMs. But this is our that terminology that you would use. This is the slide that I show my clients. And then when they see the slide, they tell me, Edgar, I'm gonna do a 1031 exchange. I'm not gonna be able to be, pay all those taxes. Look at that, this is, is shocking. And this is a fact, by the way. If you sell the property in California, you are subject, that property is subject to this type of taxes. And this is applicable on day one when you close escrow. Remember we talk about the capital gains? 20% cap rate. So imagine for every dollar, you're gonna take out 20 cents, 20%. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Then you have to pay 3.8% for a healthcare tax. Then you have to pay your state tax, 17.3. And last but not least, recapture depreciation. When you own a property, an investment property, Every year, you take advantage or a benefit of that depreciation. Depreciation is your best friend. Those who are accounting majors, you know what I'm talking about, finance major. Depreciation is like, like an expense you have. It's, it's a, it's a write-off that you have every year on your investment. But keep in mind, right? If you are going to sell that property in the future, you have to recapture that back. So if you don't do a 1031 exchange, you have to pay, look at this. 25% recapture depreciation tax. 
not on the capital gains. This is in addition to the capital gain tax rate. You have to pay that 25%. How much you get if you add this up? 62 plus 62%. Can you imagine for every dollar that you, every profit that you get, every dollar, you have to pay 62%? It, this is a fact. This is why 1031 exchange is. It's a method that uh, if you know how to do it, which uh, you are learning today how to do this, uh, it's going to create wealth because this 62% is going to be added to your wealth, to, to your net worth. So this is very shocking. So this is a history of uh, 1031 exchange. Uh, we're going to go through the slides and we'll take a little break. But basically, I told you guys it has been over 80 years. So that, that, that law passed in 1921. The Congress enacted that law of 1031 exchange. So over the past, from 1921 to 1979, people were exchanging properties. But there was no guidance as far as the time period that you're going to be exchanging a property. So what happened in 1979, this is the, the biggest case ever in the US related to real estate, where a family, the Starker family and his son, they own Timberland. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to purchase property and sell this property to a paper company for $5 million. So they were able to do the exchange but they wanted to do the exchange within five years. The IRS and the, the, the government didn't allow it. So what happened, They this is a case study in a case law that became in effect in 1979 because they won the case when they, they took the US government to court. And as a result of them winning the case, now there's, there are all these fundamentals and all these new codes that you have to follow. And this is all the terminology that you're gonna be followed today. And, and, and this is where you're gonna be learning about how to do a 1031 exchange transaction because this case set up the time period that you have to do this exchange. Before there was, there was not set up about a time period, but because of this case, you have to do a 1031 exchange within 180 days. But the first 45 days, you have to identify a property. You have to identify the property that you are going to be purchasing. So let me repeat, the transaction has to be done within 180 days. That's about six months. But please, if you are going to be talking to your clients, don't tell your clients gonna be six months because six months can be 181, 182 days. This is like, that get very technical because you have to sign and put a postmark on the date that you're going to be closing escrow. When you sell the property and before you buy a replacement property, that day one counts from one to 180 days. So within that time period, 45 days, you have to identify the property within 45 days. And there are rules to follow, by the way. So 45 days, you have to fit or meet three rules. One of the three rules that you have to meet. So important to do that. Before we get into that, let's, uh, let's pause for a moment. And before we go to, into a break, Think about this, these are the profits that are not applicable for a 1031 exchange. Can you do the honors, the first one? Can you read that? Okay, so the first one is personal use property, principal risk. What is that? It's like your own property, like, like, your, like where you reside, where you live. Where you live, right? Can you do a 1031 exchange where you property, let's say your property where you live, can you sell down and do a 1031 exchange? You cannot. Why? It's not 
requirements. That's right. And I want to tell you the reason why specifically. Use. It's used for personal use. It has to be an investment producing profit. So that's the reason why. So important. Many people tell me, you know, can I sell my house and go buy my apartment building? Can I do a 1031 exchange in that house that I live? The answer is no. But there's way to go about, by the way, we talk about that later. But generally speaking, you cannot do a 1031 exchange on personal res residence. Okay, read the next one. Uh, second home. What is a second home? I was going to say it's a vacation home. It's kind of similar to a vacation home, actually. Some people can have like two homes, right? Live in the summer, live in the winter, I mean, one in the summer, another one, you know? Second home, that's for personal use. So that second home, you cannot use, it. they cannot do a thing to one exchange. How about the third one? A uh, vacation home, but you can say like, because it's intended for your personal use and not as an investment property. That's right, yeah. Hey, you know, I, I bought a cabin in uh, in Big Bear, but I want to do a thing to one exchange. Can, Edgar, can you do that? What's your name? Pin. Can I do that? Can't. Why? Because you're using that cabin for um, personal use. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Um. So with that vacation home, do you have it and you visit it often, but say you rent it out for like you put it on Airbnb for two months a year, it only gets rental like maybe four weeks out of the year. You put it back. <laughs> now you're talking to me. Do you see right now? Well, you said right now, you're formulating strategies now, right? So we'll get to see that. that now we're getting to, now we're going deeper now into why, how we're gonna be doing the thing that one exchange. Okay. What you said is excellent, by the way. What you said, everybody online, can you repeat what you said again? You, you purchase one property, your house, but then you want to rent it out? Yeah, even if you do it for this site. Like right so he wants to rent out for a few months a year but it's your property so the rule is that you have to rent it for at least three to four months by the way there's a time period too to do that if you do that but you have to claim that in your tax return as well keep that in mind right that income because remember we talk about has to be income producing property so right now you're talking about like a hybrid right your primary home but then you're gonna have any income producing property as well, right? Yeah. So you have to claim that in your tax return as income, right? So the answer, yeah, you can do that, but it's super important that when you do a 1031 exchange on, on this scenario, you have to make sure that that has to be identified. Great. Okay, how about the next one? Can you read the next one? Maybe you can do it in the back, yeah. Uh, selling a business opportunity, including a built-in inventory for the world. What is that? Selling a business opportunity. Let's say if you have a cafeteria, let's say you own a market, right? Let's say you own a business, a liquor store, you have a bakery. Can you do a dental on exchange on a business opportunity? Those are considered personal, personal. So business opportunity is not real estate. Unless this business is in your real estate asset. Who, who said about uh, mixed use that somebody is interested in mixed, mixed use? Yeah, so in your mixed use property, you can have your own business. So you can sell the business with the real estate. In that scenario, you can do that. By just the business by itself, you cannot. As a matter of fact, I just uh, I closed escrow about a, a month uh, last year on a property in Torrance. My client, uh, he used to make uh, helicopter parts for Robinson helicopters. And uh, so he built his warehouse. It's an industrial building four years ago. He retired and he told me, Edgar, you know, I want to sell the business opportunity, the business, the machinery, CNC machinery, and the building itself. 
And that's what I did. So I was able to do the 1031 exchange on the whole transaction, the real estate asset, the business and the machinery, because everything's part of the a business producing property and investment income producing property. Okay, last but not least, uh, you, go ahead. You can repeat that. Yeah, um, so the property down in Pennsylvania. Can you explain that to me, flipping property? Yeah, because uh, when you flip property, your aim is to uh, increase the, the market value of it instead of uh, generating rental income. Right. So basically, let's say you purchase this house, a lot of different maintenance, and you want to repair it. Two, three months later, six months later, you want to sell that property to say you make a profit. Can I do a 10 to one exchange on that? The answer is no, you cannot. The reason why is because the intent, all those law students online as well, pay attention to this, the intent to do the 1031 exchange was not to rent. The intent was to flip and make a profit. Not, it was not an income producing property. So flipping property, you cannot do a 1031 exchange. Okay, we're gonna talk about th uh, these three rules. But let's take a little break, five minutes, and then we'll come back, and then we can resume and uh, and continue. Thank you. Continue. Okay, so now that we got the uh, the basics, you know, we set up the the ground, and uh, now we're gonna go deep, and we're gonna uh, get to case study, some examples, and uh, we're gonna have a polling, some poll polling questions online as well that we can answer and look at all these different scenarios. This is mandatory, these rules. You have to satisfy one of these three rules. The first rule, the three property rule, keep this in mind guys. So you sold, what do we call that property that we sold? Relinquish, relinquish right? So you sold that relinquished property because you want to buy a, so replacement property, right? So relinquish replacement property. And we cannot touch the money, right? The cash, we cannot touch that sales proceeds. And who's going to hold that, those funds? Accommodator, right? That intermediary, the accommodator. So relinquish property, money goes into the accommodator on your behalf, holding the funds and then you find a replacement property. Got it? Relinquish, accommodator, replacement property. So you have to meet, satisfy this one of these three criteria. Keep this in mind, there's a form that has been used for many years that you have to fill out. It's gonna be step. The day that you sell that property, right? So you need to satisfy one of these rules to make sure your 1031 exchange is going to work, okay? And at the same time, you have to have an agreement set up with your accommodator to confirm that you are not going to be touching those funds. Super important to do that, right? Rinko's property funds to the accommodator. You sign an agreement with the accommodator to act on your behalf. You are empowering the accommodator to hold the funds. And then you find that replacement property. The accommodator is going to be sending the funds to purchase that replacement property. It's amazing that this, uh, this mechanism sounds simple, but I still get on a weekly basis to about this all the time okay so now that we know this scenario we need to satisfy three rules let's talk about the first one and by the way this is on the form that has to be filled out so you have to satisfy one of those three rules first one three property rule so simple 
within that 45 days, you have to identify three properties. Hi, welcome. Hello. How are you? Yes, I'm late. Yeah, no problem here. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to see you. So we have to identify, we're talking about the uh, the three rules to identify property. So the, the first rule, you have to project in the future which property you're going to be purchasing. So one of the rules is that you're going to be enlist or list three properties. So you have 45 days to do that. Do you remember how many times you have, to, you have how much time you have to complete the transaction? Right? So day one to 180 days, right? So within 180 days, you have to complete the transaction. But the first 45 days, you have to satisfy this rule within the 45 days, which is that you identify three properties. Sounds so simple, right? If you are super confident that you're going to buy that property, that will satisfy that rule. When you say right now, it's many investors think like that, right? My suggestion to you is that list two more, just in case. Because on day 46, if you have not identified any properties, you cannot do a 1031 exchange anymore. So you have to identify the three properties. And if one of them falls out, if, so if you only identify one on day 46, that deal falls through, you can't go find another. You got it. You cannot, let me repeat what you said, everybody on your line. You identify one property to satisfy that three property rule within the 45 days. So she made the rule, she made that condition, that criteria. But on day 46 or 47, that deal fall through. She didn't, she couldn't purchase that property that she identified. Can she go back and identify two more on day 46, 47? The answer is no, you cannot do that. Because you have to do it within the first 45 days. So it has to be done within the first 45 days. Sounds so simple, but you have to really understand the concept. So you identify three rules. But look at the beauty about this rule. This is the beauty about the rule. Since you brought it up, can you read what it says uh, uh, underneath the three property rule? No limit on the number of value. No limit on the number of value. When we talk about like kind, kind, the value, you could identify a property that's worth two, three, four, five times more. If you sold one for 500,000, you can identify one for 2 million, 1 million, 2 million, 1.5, 800,000. There's no, there's no limit on the value, but there's a limit on the number, right? The maximum property may be three, only three. Remember the condition also is that you have to you have to make sure that it's the same value or more, you know. So just make sure that the value is same or more, right? Okay. Let's go. Question. Yeah. Do you recommend like finding the property that you want to purchase before you think about selling your own your current property since you have such a close window? This is what you said right now. She's right now by asking that question. She formulated a strategy already. Do I start me as a broker representing all these investors? And they tell Edgar, you know what? I want to sell this property. You know, I want to do a 1031 exchange. Do you think that I'm going to be waiting on day one to find a property? No way. I'm going to start looking for something before day one. So the answer to the question is yes, you can do that before day one. So the clock start ticking from day one to 180, right? So do I, do I start at day two or day three? Let's say you sold the property today. You haven't done anything. Oh no, next week. I'll start next week. That's already seven day pass, right? Seven minus 45, right? So you, you have less time to identify the property. So it's better to start before, you know? 10 days pass and then you haven't, identify anything. 
45 minus 10 is 35. You only have 35 days left to identify. So it's super important for you to start before. So that's what I do. This is why I love what I what I do. It's like I'm constantly looking for property for my client on a daily basis. I have a in my database, I have notes. I'm always like talking to clients, meeting people, because I have investors who are looking for property to do 1031 exchange. And I don't want to have that pressure to be on day 45 and I haven't identified any property. You see how my business is, is, I love what I do. You know, it's extremely exciting. Of course, you make good commission as well, right? <laughs> so if you are in the market, if you want to uh, uh, open a brokerage company, you can earn up to 6% of that deal. So it's, it's, it's very good. Okay. Now we're going deep. Okay. So let's go to rule number two. Okay. Read the second rule. Uh, the 20% rule. There's no limit on the number of properties so long as the aggregate value of the properties identified does not exceed 200% of the aggregate value of the loan. There you go. So identify four more properties with a total up to the limit of two times the sales price. 500,000, I wanna satisfy the 200% rule. So I can identify up to a million. Simple as that, right? You sold your $2 million property, you can identify up to 4 million. Your apartment building, that building that your parents or your family, friends, they own, 40 in the property, let's say it's like 10 million, you can identify up to 20 million. So that's a 200% rule. You see what it says here? No limit to the number of properties. So you can start identifying three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 properties, right? But make sure it doesn't go over the 200% rule. So this is, a, this is how you can start strategizing, right? Perhaps you sold that triplex and you went to buy, let's say, four condos, right? You listed four properties. It, didn't have to be, it doesn't have to be three. You can go up to four, right? So you have to identify which one you're going to go when you start the process? When you start the process, yeah. When you, you identify, the rule is that you have to start identifying on day one that you sold. When you no, I mean, like, so if you are going to use the 200% rule, you're not going to do the three properties. That's right. So when you are filling up the paperwork, you're going to say, I'm selling this and I'm going to use the, you pick which rule. You're That's correct. Use. Exactly right. So, so far, uh, can you, any of you tell me the difference between the three proper rule and the 200% rule in your own words? No limit on the value for the three property, but there's a limit on 200% rule, and then the 200% rule has no limit on the number of properties, and the three property rule is the only identified three. That's right. So the 200% rule, you can identify four, five, ten properties, right? But what's the boundary, the parameters? 200%. Yes. I'm just curious, since these are kind of inverses of each other, are there any of the rules that you've had more success with, or is it just more circumstance? There we go. If you're gonna become a consultant, a broker, on a broker's company, or an investor, you know, that's how you think, you know? That's how you think. Which is gonna be the one that is more successful, or the one that has less headache, or the one that has uh, uh, less stress, right? So this is one, what your question uh, relates to, the experience that you have in the industry. As you go do more than 31 exchanges, you start developing that experience. So over the past 15 years, to answer your question is, because when we talk about the third one, it's gonna throw a, a, a curve, a curve on all of us, right? You always go with the basics, three property rule. Start with the basics. And then if you cannot satisfy that, Go to the 200%. I do that all the time. All the time. So it just depends on the deal and the goal that your client wants is how you 
time is my enemy. That's right. And keep this in mind, right? And we, there's another component to this uh, criteria, by the way, we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute. This is when you start formulating strategies as, as far as how much cash am I gonna put into the deal, more down payment, or how much more leverage borrow, how much more are you gonna borrow on that transaction? It's gonna make a huge difference, by the way. And yes, you can you can bring new money in, by the way. Like if you have extra cash and you wanna buy, let's say, let's say you found a property that you fall in love, like, oh my God, this property, I want this property because I'm connected, it's a good location, it's a property I always wanted to buy, you know? But let's say it doesn't satisfy, you know, this rule, right? You can bring new cash coming in. Let's say you 500,000, and let's say you have another two, 300,000 in the bank, you can bring that in the transaction as well. You know? Now we're getting more deep into probably the strategies. You know? Okay, so once again, what's the difference between the three property rule and the 200% rule? The major difference? The value, right? Versus the number of property, right? So going back to your question, right? Which one do you think is better? I would think the three property rule because the value is probably what matters the most because the value will achieve like more value will achieve maximum profit as opposed to uh, just having this 200% property. That's exactly right. The three property rule, because there's no limit on value, right? But here's the catch, right? Do you think all deals go through when you are opening an escrow, when you want to buy something? Is there a perfect world? No way, right? <laughs> No way, right? So three property rule, how many properties? Three. Three is not too many. It's not too many, right? So that's the catch of what you said. So keep that in mind always, right? What are the possibilities that you are going to be closing escrow or one of those three, right? And sometimes you say to yourself, yeah, he wants to buy. I know the owner. I know the seller. I have no problem. but you always have to start thinking about your backup plan. What is your backup? The 200% rule. So have more properties in your list, potential list, ready to go. Don't just rely on the three. I highly recommend to always look at more and more and more and more. Can you change rules once you start it? As long as it's within the, how many days? 45? That's right. A lot can happen in 45 days, right? You can start with a three property or maybe the next morning you say, you know what? No, I'm gonna go with the 200% rule. Maybe the next week, uh, maybe I'll go back to the three property. But on day 46, on day 50, you cannot go back in time because you have already signed that form and stamped that form, the three property rule or the 200%. Okay, now we're gonna go with the curveball. And this, this is the one that is used by most sophisticated brokers, sophisticated investors, investors who have lots of properties, investors who want to change portfolios, investors who has a portfolio that sells 10, 10 buildings, and they say, you know what? Let's go into a different market and buy 20, 20 buildings instead of 10. That's what one scenario. So that's why they, they have this second, that's third rule, the 95% rule. Can you do the honors in the back, the 95% rule? Yeah, listen to that, right? Any number of properties without really like to add to the value, right? Any number, so now, this is sweet, right? So now we're not talking about the number of properties and we're not even talking about the value. Sweet, right? Okay, continue. Ooh. Got it? And you see portfolio position. Can anybody explain to me about past purchase on at least 95% of the value of identified? 
That was actually going to be my question. Is it 95% of what you sold or 95% of what you plan to buy? That's right. Or you're trying to buy. Everything that you're listing, you have to buy 95% of those properties. That's a catch, right? Sophisticated investor using your models, using your cap rates that we talked about, you know, they say, you know what? This makes sense, you know? I'm gonna sell this one cap rate of uh, four and a half for another one for cap rate of 5.1, 5.2. And by the way, that's what I did in one transaction we're gonna look at a case study. That's what I did, you know? So you're replacing cap rates, more cash flow, more income, you know? So it makes sense. It makes sense to, to go with the 95% rule because you are you have a portfolio of properties and you want to find another portfolio of properties in a different market or perhaps in the same market. You know? So that's 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 why you use this 95% rule. Okay. Yes, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, raise your hand. Which one uh, will you use uh, if you are um, an investor? The three property rule, the 200% rule, or the 95% rule? Which one do you think it's uh, you will use in a transaction that you uh, you want to do in the next year or two? What do you think? Because it depends on like the value and how many properties I'm getting rid of. Like, like you said, if I have a list of seven properties that I want to get rid of, and I know I've identified 10 more that I want and the likelihood of me closing on at least eight of them is high, I'll go with the 95% rule. Okay. But if I have a not sure on everything else, I probably go for this. I agree with you. Anybody else? How about you? What do you think? <clears throat> uh, well, it, it depends. You know, it, it, it's actually it, it's me with my limited equity. I would probably go with three, three property rule. Um, but if I'm you know, if it's a scared investor, I would probably look at the 95% rule. Yeah. And, you know, with our, you know, I didn't get value. Yeah, I think that I, I, I like the 200% rule a lot personally uh, because uh, just the no limit of the amount of properties, you know, it's, it's more of a as a broker, you know, for me, I relax more, you know, and 200% is a, is a lot of money, you know, double to what you're selling. Usually, you sell for more, better property, better location, it's going to be worth more. So that 200% rule is the one that I really, really enjoy, you know? How about you? What do you think? Uh, I would say the 95% rule seems like the most flexible. So you don't have to worry about the problems. Right. Or the second one, you get that 95% rule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think that, by the way, once you become more uh, more experienced, I agree with you, is that's the one that gives them the most flexibility, you know? And go back to remember the comment that you said about can I just identify one and call it a day? Right? That means that you are, feel super confident, right? That you are going to buy it. It's not going to fail through, you know? So 95% of that property, you probably the safest two or three, you will buy it, you know? So it's, it depends on you know, your comfort level, you know, and your experience that you have. You know? How about you in the back? Mm -hmm. Do you like the three property rule or the two hundred percent rule? Do you mind? Do you prefer to have a somebody not telling you no more than three properties or no no limit on the value? I I would want to see three rules. Yeah, I yeah, I agree with you. How about you? So I was thinking like early on the three property rule would be more um, helpful at the other level. But then obviously later on, I don't know the way to be more attractive to me the 200 percent rule. But I guess you like you said the flexibility of the three percent rule also is just really nice. Um, that being no limit on the property, like 200% is like um, a large percent. 
Yeah, because two hundred percent is a large percentage. You know, it's not like a one and a half. You know, yeah. one fifth. Two hundred percent is is lots. You know, how about you in the back? Um, I agree with what everyone's been saying, like about um, scale of like your investments, how that impacts it. The three property rule does make me a little nervous just because three properties is like not a ton. Yeah. Um, so I do like the flexibility of the two other rules. I think if you have enough like investors and you want that flexibility, the 95% rule is just like a good rule to use. But I also agree with the 200% rule. Um, it's a big enough like gain, like the big enough percentage. It's a big percentage, yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't impact my decision that much. I agree with you, and and uh, it's all about the value, right? Like kind, right? The value. If the value is like uh, even think about this, right? Even let's say three hundred thousand. Think about a property that's worth three hundred thousand, right? That's a big difference between a property of three hundred thousand versus six hundred thousand. On a different scale, right? So two hundred percent rule is is a is a lot of percentage. It's a big percentage. You know? So yeah, I agree with you. Two hundred. So most of the class I agree on the two hundred percent rule, the route to take, and and I second that. Can we uh? Can we go ahead and do the polling? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do a, a polling online in in the class, and uh, let's answer yes or no, and then uh. Let's apply what we have learned so far in those scenarios about the 200% rule. Let's apply about the situation of the, the questions and, 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 uh, and we'll go and, and talk about it. Let's go to the first question. Can everybody see it? Can I sell under trust name and buy a replacement? under my husband and wife's name, single choice. So you own a property under your trust and you want to sell this property and then you wanna buy it under your wife and your husband's name. Can you do that, yes or no? Okay. Everybody online that uh, they can do the polling? Just open up? It's open now. Okay. You, can, you can respond. <clears throat> okay. Okay, all is going. So you're selling a, a property under your trust name and you want to replace it and the replacement property is going to be under husband, wife's name. The answer is? So far as Mostly no online. So basically, you can replace that property under your name. And that's because the trust uses your own social security number. So when you purchase a replacement property, you purchase it under your social security number to identify the property. So the answer is yes, you can do that. Okay, let's go to the second one. 
By the way, how many of you said uh, yes or no? Yes, you guys, you can do that, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So go to the second one. Can investors go their own separate ways in exchange when title is in partnership? So you you have a property that you have uh, that you purchase it, and you have it on a on a partnership. Let's say you set up an LLC to purchase that property many years ago, but then you want to go your own way. In other words, you open escrow, and then time of escrow, you just want to cash out and, and go my separate way. Can I do that? Online, 50-50. What do you think, you guys? Um, Let's say all of us in the class right now, we purchased this property four or five years ago, and we set up an LLC. Most properties uh, in California are, are set up under LLC as far as an investment is concerned, you know? And then, but we decided, you know what? Let's sell it. We made enough money. Let's use those sales proceeds for something else. So we're gonna divide into equally share for all of us when we close escrow. Can I do that? Uh, I would think so. If you could have like some sort of termination of the partnership agreement, then you might be able to. Have... What you said is correct. As long as you wait after you close escrow and the agreement is set up prior. You cannot do it without no agreement. So the agreement has to be set up when you open escrow or before. You cannot make that decision at the time that you sold the property. Oh, let's go on and sell away. So that's the answer is in. Excellent. Okay, let's go to the third one. When investors sell their relinquished property and buy a replacement property, can they hold back cash for the sale from the sale or capital improvement for, of the replacement property? So you sold your property, your relinquished property. And then, you know, I don't want to use all that money. I want to keep some money for something else for capital improvement. I want to improve, do some repairs. Can I do that? Part of that equity, that sales process, you want to keep something for yourself. What do you think? Hmm? No. Who said no? Okay, why? Exactly right. He's exactly right. And how are you going to be triggered in that capital gain? By pulling the equity out of the sale. Because you are going to have access to that money. The moment that you have access to that money, you trigger capital gains. So you cannot touch that money. The moment that you touch that money, then it triggers capital gain. By the way, I, I have a lot of clients who they are already very established and they decide to pay capital gains on not the entire amount, but portion of the amount. So let's say you've sold a prop for 2 million and you're gonna buy it once for 1.5, you wanna keep 500,000. And they said, remember that 62% tax rate we're talking about? They're willing to pay that 62%. No, nope. I'm gonna go enjoy my money, but that's gonna trigger the capital gains on that money that you have access to. How about online? How's our number three? Let's see. So you guys said yes, 59% uh, and 39% uh, said no. So this is, uh, okay, let's go to number four. Can investors pay off all their loans on a personal, on personal property that they own? So you sold the property, but then you have some, uh, some debt, some credit card payments, you know? Can I use that money to pay off the credit card payments? 
or maybe to go purchase a, a, a car, you know? Can I do that? What do you think? Can investors pay out other loans on a personal property that they own? 60% said yes, 40% said no. Can investors pay out other loans on personal property that they own? What do you think? Using the money, the sale of the money, yeah. Um, I guess I know the same thing. That's right. The moment they money, they trigger capital gains. Let's go to number five. Can an investor sell to a related party or buy it from a related party? This happens so many times in families. You guys that uh, your family's own property, you know, I want to sell this property to my mom, to my dad, to my brother, my relatives. Can I do that? Can you sell one property and keep it in the family to a, a family member? What do you think? Seventy-three percent say yes. 27% said no. What do you think? You. No problem. So you want to sell the property to a family member. Can I do that? Can you do it? Can you sell one property to a family member? Mom, dad, brother, sister? I think you can, but I think you'd have to take out the inside. It's amazing that they're very strict on this rule. As, as long as uh, in the lineage of your family, grandma, grandpa, parents, kids, son, daughters, you can do that as long as they also do an attentive one exchange. So they have to be also, they have to also be become an exchanger as well under those conditions only. So online is 73% uh, yes, 27% said no. What do you mean they have to be, like if they're buying it, what do you mean they have to become an exchange or so? Right, yeah. exactly, because uh, there's, there's a lot of- uh, Does that mean that trends. when they get rid of it, it has to be under a 1031 That's right, oh. exactly right, you said it, right. Because a lot of people, they, a lot of families, uh, they have been denied because they didn't follow that rule, you know? You have to have a also an exchange agreement with that buyer. So that family member also has to be in a temporary one exchange as well. Yeah. So yeah. That, that be in that uh, 45 day window. Yeah. To kind of buy like kind of property. Exactly right. Now that you, you really analyze that one pretty good. Yeah, exactly right. So that replacement property, right? And that seller of that replacement property has to be also in an exchange as well. So both parties has to be in exchange. That's right, you're correct. Okay, let's go to number six. Okay, can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan for the buyer? Can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan for the buyer? This used to happen a lot in the, in the previous cycle, you know, recession, like not 2008, but in 2000, that there were a lot of properties for sale and the buyer didn't have all the funds available for the down payment. So you would offer a second trustee, another loan. You would lend the money to that buyer. Follow me? So you're selling the property, right? You're selling your relinquished property and you find somebody who wants to buy it, right? But that person who wants to buy it, does he have all the money, all the down payment to purchase that property that you're selling, the exchange you're selling? Can that exchanger lend some money to this buyer, like a loan, right? Give him a loan. It's called a trust, second trust deal. Can you do that? You know? So that's you as a seller, right? 
He's selling the property in front of buyer. So that buyer wants to purchase the property but doesn't have all the down payment. You as a seller say, you know what? I can lend you some money. Here's $50,000, $100,000. I'll lend you some money so you can purchase it. Can you do that? So that's what the question is all about. That's what it's called carry back. Carry back alone. Are we able to see the, uh, on the screen that question? See what? Uh, question number six. Wait, no, oh, sorry. Yeah. See, I think you have to scroll down on your end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That's. Okay, so is there a random In the center of the repression property carry back a loan for the buyer? Yes. That's the question. Number six. Yeah. So the answer is what do you think? You, you cannot, I want to tell you why you cannot. You cannot because you have access. That money, so you have access to that money, so it's going to trigger capital gains. So you cannot lend that money to somebody else. So that cannot happen. Okay, let's go number seven. Can the seller obtain a line of credit from equity line of the, which is called the HELOC? Can the seller obtain a line of credit Does anybody know what is a HELOC line of credit? So you own a property and you go to the bank and uh, you ask the bank to give you another loan tied to that property. That's a HELOC, you know? And you wanna do that when you're gonna do a 1031 exchange. In other words, you're, you plan to sell the property, but then you say to yourself, you know what? Before we sell that property, let's pull some money out. Let's get another loan. Home equity line. Can we do that? The answer is you cannot do that. Is there a time frame or you can't have a key lock on there at all? Those law students, again, the word is intent. If your intent was to do a 1031 exchange, you cannot do that. So no, I'm saying like, so say you've had the HELOC for like three years and then you go there. If you had it before, yeah. Okay. And actually that, that's one of the conditions that as long as like two, at least two years prior, okay. but on, on day, let's say today, right? You go get a, a home and equity line and then tomorrow you want to sell that property, do a thing to the one exchange, you cannot do it. You should have done it like at least two years before because it doesn't show intent, right? And intent to that you were going to do that. Yeah. You will go to the next one. Number eight. Okay, can the seller of the rangers property move into the replacement property as a primary residence? This question, I get asked this question at least twice a week, by the way. So look at the scenario, right? So you have your investment property, right? Can the seller of the relinquished property move into the replacement property? So you have your relinquished property. You made all this money, right? And you found this beautiful home in Malibu, in PV, here in the area, in the South Bay area, that you want to purchase. So you want to use all these funds, give it to the accommodator. The accommodator is going to go purchase a replacement property, which is going to be the, the your dream home. Can you do that? Online is 37 yes, 63 percent no. What do you think? I don't care. Why? Um, because it's 
residents of primary, primary residents. Ooh, um, you were paying attention. That's exactly right. Remember we talked about in the beginning, slide, which properties are not exchangeable? But continue, the reason why. Um, yeah, I, I was just confused as to whether it kind of applies to the basement property as well as the um, If it applies to both ways, then yes, it does. You can get a little bit of property that's primarily in this Yeah, put that idea on hold for a moment. How about you, Ethan? What do you think? I was going to say the same thing. I was also confused, like, if the, like, property eligible only if that's the primary residence and then you can like use the replacement one as the primary residence. I wasn't sure about that, but if that does apply, then if like if it applies, you know, like you can't use the replacement property as the primary residence, then I would say no. So let me set up the stage one more time, you know, because uh let's confirm online everybody. So you own your investment property. That you decide to do a thing that you want to change, right? You already identify one of the three rules. You're going to satisfy all the three rules. The market has changed. So you made a lot of money. There's a lot of equity on that investment property, duplex, that apartment building, that industrial property, commercial building, mixed use property. You have all this money that you're going to be making, all these sales proceeds, right? So you have all these funds. Remember, it's a replacement property, so that means that was an investment property, right? To begin with, right? Think through what you. So that's one of the questions asking. It's asking, can all these funds, right, for this relinquished property, this investment property, investment property, can I use this money to purchase my primary residence where you're gonna live? I think mean, that's what we're asking. Is the rule that applies to the relinquished property no proper applies to the replacement property? That's correct. So that replacement property cannot be for primary residence. Cannot. 100%. It has to be an investment, it has to be an income producing property. But the relinquished property can be to the primary residence. No. That's correct. Repeat what you said right now. You can, if you relinquish the property, it's no longer an investment property. So you can then make the primary residence. Follow what you said right now. So I want to make sure that everybody's on the same. Can I relinquish property? Move, you can move into a relinquished property? Sold it. But, so you sold that relinquished property, right? So that property that you sold, X, right? So it's not there no more, oh, right? Okay. So it's out. But, so you sold it to someone but, but keep in mind, right? That's right. So somebody else purchased the property, which was one of the questions we asked. Can that property, can you sell it to your mom, dad, or someone in the family? The answer is yes, yeah, as long as that person is also doing a thing to one exchange. Then you can not. Right, so, so, yeah. right, so then you cannot, right? Because that relinquished property is already gone. But what, what did you get instead of that relinquished property? In lieu of relinquished, when you sold the property, what did you get? Oh, you got you replace it with the property. You have all this money, right? All the funds, yeah. right? That you, and who holds the funds? Yeah. Who holds the funds? The accommodator. Fund. So you have the relinquished property, that in, investment property. So it's sold to someone, right? To a buyer. And if that buyer was your mom, dad, no, it has to be a 1031 exchange, but it was a buyer. X buyer, not related to you, right? So somebody else owns that relinquished property, but that person paid money for that relinquished property. So now you don't have that property anymore. Now you have funds, right? And that funds went to a, an accommodator. Right? So the accommodator now is holding the funds on your behalf. So that's the question is, can I go, right? Buy my private residence, it's beautiful home. Can you believe that there are exceptions to this rule? Just an exception to this rule. But the answer is, so what's the answer to this question? No, except for. Huh? Who no, says yes? Raise your hand, nobody in the class? Who says no? Okay, everybody in the class says no. Okay, so no one is saying the online. 
66% said no. Good job, guys, online. Love that. Okay. Can, can we go, scroll down to see the, the question exception? Okay. Anyway, so uh, let's go to the last question. Last question. Yeah, that's fine. So on that question, there's an exception to that rule, by the way. It's called an anticipated <clears throat> event. If there is an unanticipated event, by the way, is it the, in the code, that word, unanticipated event? Think about that word for a moment. That's the word that's going to be the exception to this rule. Can we type that uh, online? Unanticipated event? Type it? Yeah. Like in the chat? Yeah. <clears throat> so going back to the same question, right? So you sold that rental property, you have all this fund, the accommodator has up the money, you want to go buy that primary residence, that beautiful home that you want to buy, you know, or ex home, you know, something nice. So we know that you cannot do that, right? We said no, right? So there's an exception to the rule, and it's called an anticipated event. Can you guys think of an anticipated event? Any of you that can happen, something that can happen in life per se, in your life or in life, something that is anticipated? Give me one example. Okay. Go. I was thinking like natural investors or tax and oil. You got it. Did, did you anticipate that event? Did you, did you schedule that event, that disaster that happened? The answer is no, right? That's one exception. You're very smart. Excellent. Anybody else? Unanticipated event. I want to give you the answer, but I I, I feel that uh, just uh, go deeper into your brain to see if uh, you can uh, see something that in your life or somebody's life that was not predicted or anticipated, but it will happen. Ooh, that one. Uh, like your house burning down? Right, a disaster like he's talking about, right? No, no, but you're right. Something that was not anticipated, right, at all. I'll give you a hint. In somebody's life, we are on earth today. We live here and Eventually, what's going to happen to our bodies in the future? Yeah, that's right. Death. That's an anticipated event. That's another exception to the rule. If that happens, at death, then you can do that. Who has to die? No, okay. no, that was my question. <laughs> what was the question? Who has to die? It is a person who, so like say I was doing the 1031 and then I died. So does that mean my heirs can still purchase the That's correct. Move in? Now we're going, now we got, we went deep into now the analysis. That's when you start connecting trust, the real work of the trust. You start thinking about your LLC, your partnership investors. Remember we talked about in the beginning about when you start uh, setting up partners or visualize uh, how you're going to be, what type of property you want to purchase, with whom you want to purchase the property. You have to evaluate all of that in those transactions, you know? So yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer. That's right. Somebody else? There's one more. I'll give you a hint. You meet someone. You have a family with someone. You set up a life with someone, everything's fine as far as owning property together. But eventually life is not perfect, right? Or perhaps you make a decision to go separate. What do you call that? Divorce. That's right. Divorce is the other exception to the rule. 
unanticipated event. Did you anticipate that it was going to happen when you first got together? The answer is no. So that's that's the other the other exception to the rule. Isn't it great? But yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. So you said that you can't live in a, an investment property as a primary residence without paying capital gains on it. What about as like a vacation home? Like, can you spend a, a week in your investment property in uh, Palm Springs? Remember, uh, we talk about the slide uh, about properties that are, are not exchangeable. And one of them was vacation home. One of them was a vacation home. And so, yeah, you cannot do an exchange by them. But to your point though, right? You hit like perhaps like a mini loophole, loophole you know? Why shouldn't I just move in, you know, enjoy that vacation home? You can still enjoy it as a vacation home, but you're not paying rent to yourself. Yeah. It's not an income producing property. But it's still enjoying, yeah. yeah. But you can like rent out. That's as remember, we uh, you can rent out as long as you claim that in your taxes, that income you're gonna be making, and it has to be at least three months. If it's like a one week uh, rental that you do, or like a six month rental, yeah, but like a short term rental, it's not going to be allowed. Yeah. Good observation, I like that. So let's, we're gonna take, let's say a couple of two, three minutes break, you know, and we'll watch a video when we'll come back and then we can, uh, we can uh, get a, a, a last hour uh, talking about a case study that I did, okay? Let's take a little break. So we'll do now uh, this uh, last hour, uh, we're gonna watch a video. This video is going to recap everything we talked about today. Uh, it's gonna add two more components to the 1031 exchange, which is bringing uh, new cash into the transaction. And also something that we haven't talked about yet, that property that you sold, that relinquished property has a loan. If it's not all cash, right? Had a loan. So that replacement property, you have to have get another loan for the same amount or more of the prop, the property that you, you sold. In other words, let's say the five hundred thousand dollar property, you had a three hundred thousand loan. That relinquish that replacement property, you also have to have get a loan for the same amount. Got that? So you had a loan on the relinquished property. That amount of loan, you have to replace it with a new loan. You have to get a, a new loan for the same amount. There are some investors who don't want to get more loan, more debt. So what they do is they bring cash into the transaction so they don't have to have that debt. So let's say if you had a property that had a 200,000 200, loan amount and you purchase that replacement property, but you don't wanna go to the bank and get another loan for 200,000, right? So you are able to bring new cash into the transaction. So instead of getting a 200,000 loan from the bank, you can bring new cash. In other words, you can bring 200,000 cash into the transaction. So let's take a look at this video. Ready? Uh, uh, the volume? The That's, uh, you go. Oh, you know what it might be? Sorry, is the candles on the Maybe I'm wondering if did when you share the screen, did you share the audio? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, that would be it. That's exactly what it is. Because your volume's on. Right here. 
that's your last product. Here they can you hear it? So right now when I explain in simple terms, center the white change, and we are you gotta turn off the light up audio now. And then you're volume at the bottom right. Like bottom right of the entire screen. Let's look at the sound from the long screen. This one. This one. That's what you I wanted to ask you. Okay, so like right now. This video is, is going to include all the fundamentals and the time audio. period of the 1031 exchange. It's going to also explain to you about the 180 days time period and the 45 days that you need to identify the property. And also, it's going to talk about the uh, the, the three rules we talked about. You know, if you try to. Ready? So the clock start ticking when you start those asteroids.
That's what we talk about. You can bring the cash in. So those are the fundamentals of the 1031 exchange. Can we get up this side? Okay, so this is a recap. What is a 1031 exchange? Somebody read that to me. Uh, the 1031 exchange is a process that allows investors to avoid paying capital gains and to sell your investment property. Right, so this is the method that you're going to follow so you can defer the taxes. Okay, next one. The seven benefits of a 1031 exchange are to increase your cash flows, improve the quality of your real estate assets. Right. And then the last but not least is the, the accommodator, right? That accommodator has to be a, a neutral third party, somebody not connected to you as a broker or the seller. So it has to be a third party is gonna be holding the funds on your behalf. Usually banks and title companies, they, they can actually are accommodators. I've been using the company called Safe Harbor Exchange in Orange County for the past 10, 12 years. And uh, they do that as well. Um, so you have to sign an exchange agreement with the accommodator so you can empower that person to hold the funds on your behalf. And this is a sample of an exchange agreement that you'll be signing. So you do that while it's in escrow. When you open escrow, so you set up this uh, agreement and then you empower that uh, accommodator. These are the seven benefits of doing a 1031 exchange. All investors that I represent, they pick one or the seven of these benefits. These are the reasons why you would do a 1031 exchange. Keep in mind that there's families also that have purchased property many years ago, perhaps an apartment building, and they're happy where they're at. You know, they don't want to do any exchange, any upgrade. You know, but if you can connect to one of these seven benefits, then that's going to trigger in your mind to go through the process of doing a ten to one exchange. You know, so one of the reasons someone we want to do a 1031 exchange is better location. Perhaps you want a property, let's say like Carla online in San Pedro, perhaps uh, there was a property in LA, that location was so, so, but she wants to go to San Pedro and purchase a property. You can do that. Your scenario perhaps out of state and you want to, buy a property, let's say near my house, something I can uh, have access to it, I can supervise and it's close to home. That's another reason why. So that's part of the better location. Second benefit, second uh, benefit, newer building. You purchased a property many years ago, you know, from the 1920s, had a lot of deferred maintenance, but that's all you can afford, you know, it's within your budget. Now that you want to build your portfolio, you, you decide, you know what? I want to buy a better property, a newer building, you know? Maybe not in the 1920s and 1930s, maybe something was built in the 1950s and 60s. That's another reason why newer building. Third reason, more units. So, transaction, the case study that I have, 
I'll show it to you guys. My client sold, I sold four units and he purchased seven units. So if he wanted to increase his portfolio of more units, your example that you were talking about before, your family or perhaps you, they would have maybe 20 units, they want to go to 50 units. That's another reason why you want to do a 1031 exchange. I mean, you have to go through this process to increase your wealth. Better unit mix. What do you think that means, number four? Better unit mix. Anybody? It could be like mixed use, or it could be um, the number of bedrooms in each unit. That's right. I'll give you an example. I own a four, four flex, all four one bedrooms. But I don't want one bedrooms anymore. Usually one bedroom, the tenancy is less. If you rent it to a family, some tenants, and they may stay for one, two years, maybe three years at most. Generally speaking, if you have more bedrooms, the tenancy is longer. Generally speaking, you know, family of, uh, you know, mom, dad, and two kids, perhaps uh, they rent a two bedroom and they're waiting until the kids go to high school, get out of high school. That tenant is going to stay in that unit more than two, three years, you know, generally speaking. You know? So unit mix, mix is another reason why you would do a, a thing for the one exchange. So from a fourplex or each one, one bedroom, you can go to, uh, you can, it can be another fourplex, right? Like kind. But instead of having all four units, two, two bedrooms and two, one bedrooms, or it can be three, two bedrooms and one, one bedroom. So it's a better unit mix. That's another reason why somebody would move from a fourplex to another fourplex, but better unit mix. Includes cash flow. This is connected to your cap rate. You know, for so that four unit building was collecting, let's say $4,000, a thousand each. If you have a two bedroom, you may double your, your cash, you know? So that's another reason why somebody would go ahead and uh, do a 1031 exchange. More debt service. This is what operating financial leverage, right? If you borrow debt, you can use that to increase your cash flow. So this is another strategy. You can increase your cash flow by borrowing more money, right? More debt. What was happened, like I told you, what happened in 2020, 2021, the interest rates were down, right? The, the, the rates were so low that a lot of people were borrowing a lot of money to buy property. But now there's a correction in the market. Yeah. Now those mortgages are at higher rates. But what's happening now is that because of this correction in the market, there are a lot of lending institutions who are offering new products in the market. Very dangerous products also because some of them are interest only loans, but loan payment loan or ARM, the, the adjustable loans. They're not like as a conservative as a fixed rate loan. But when you purchase commercial property, like that 10 unit building, 20 unit building, six plex, maybe eight units, most of the times you are going to be applying for a commercial loan that's inadjustable. It can be like a three arm. It can be a five arm adjustable rate mortgage. That's where arms comes from. The symbol, ARM, signs, letters. So it can be for three years, it can be for five years, or it can be for seven years. If you are buying a commercial property, would you use a three year loan? So it's fixed for three years and it goes adjustable. Fixed for five years, it goes adjustable after five years. Or seven years, it goes adjustable. Let's say you're gonna purchase a six unit property. Which one would you pick? Would you pick a three year, five years, or seven years? What do you think? What would you pick? Probably the seven. 
to right now I'd probably do the seven year one. It's because you might have the lower rate. Or sorry, the three year one. So you would have uh you'd be able to get that. So basically, you are analyzing based on the interest rate level, right? To go from three or five or seven, you know? By the way, there's no right or wrong answer on that question, by the way. It's more about your risk appetite, you know? But everything you're saying, you're correct, you know? What I recommend is to price those three type of loans to see what the rates. And generally speaking, I want to tell you the answer is like the five and the seven right now is like five and a quarter. And the three is like 1% less. So which one would you pick? The three year has less rate or five or seven has more rate. Yeah, I try to go three years. Three years, right? So I'm going to tell you what's the catch. What's the catch is that three years come so quick, right? And you don't know what's going to happen in the market like in, after three years. How about if the rates go, keep going up, right? So you're going to be stuck with that even higher payment. So it's a, a bigger risk. The three year has more risk than the five and the seven, right? Because time period, right? Three years come so quick, yeah? But you took advantage of the lower rate. So that will be one of your strategies as an investor. You can say, you know what? What's more important, time or rate, right? So according to your perspective, what do you think? If you chose the three year, you chose rate, right? Instead of time. When would you make a decision to do instead of three years, let's say five and seven. Why would time be more important? Uh, do you feel like you might need just more time um, to sell that property? You may need more time to analyze more property. Remember we talked about 1031 exchange of, as far as identifying properties? Three months, six months, one year comes so quick when you're an investor, you know? So you're correct, you know, that gives you more time if you pick the five or the seven. I agree with you. So those decisions, these are the benefits of more debt, right? So you increase debt, you're gonna increase that, the, the cash flow. It's, 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 a, it's proven, you know? By the way, we have somebody online that has a question. Uh, uh, let's go to Carla. Uh, hi, Carla, can you unmute yourself? Hi there. Hi. So uh, we had a, for the company that I work for, my nine to five job, they yeah. did 1031 exchange um, when they sold uh, their headquarter building and moved into a new one. And they were told that um, we had to hire an attorney that kind of specialized in this. And, and so I was just kind of wondering, is that who the accommodator was? Is Does the accommodator have to be an attorney? Were they misinformed? We didn't need an attorney. You know, that question is so smart. And that question, everybody now is going to know the answer about. So the answer is yes, but, okay. Remember, we talked about the accommodator, the, uh, the guidelines that the accommodator has to be a neutral party. Yeah. So satisfy that guideline, make sure that neutral party is not connected to the seller or that buyer, you know? It's a neutral party. Keep that in mind, right? Okay. So we can satisfy that criteria, right? So that person can be any professional, right? Here's the catch, but make sure that entity, because it's going to be an entity who's gonna hold the funds. It cannot be a, a private party. It has to be an entity. We talked about the examples I gave you was a title company or a bank. So let's use the, uh, uh, the attorney as an example. That attorney can have an LLC or an entity, but it's a must, what I'm just gonna tell you right now, to make sure that entity has a bond. It's gonna cover enough funds to replace those funds that you put in, into the into the 1031, into the accommodator's hand. 
So my recommendation is that the bond has to be at least $5 million long uh, bond. You know, there's some bonds more, some company they have like a two, $3 million uh, bond, you know, but in the marketplace, five and above. So if, if that attorney or that LLC entity has a bond, then that person can do the uh, 1031. And by the way, an uh, can do a, can be an accommodator for a 1031 exchange transaction. Keep in mind, uh, Carla and everybody in class and everybody online, that the accommodator do not need to have a special license as an accommodator, but the accommodator, once again, has to be an entity and has to have a bond. And that criteria is fulfilled by most banks and most title companies. So that attorney can do that, uh, Carter. So I think that uh, it's not that you were misinformed, but it, was that attorney connected to the to the business, by the way, or, or was part owner of the transaction or the building, Carla? No, he was an independent third party, but we also had to use the escrow company that managed the money um, and held the money. So we had both parties. Um, the attorney was just the one who did all the paperwork and, and everything else. Yeah, I think that's the answer to that question is yes, he can do that. Okay. And more, most likely, I have a feeling that he did have a bond, by the way, to do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll take it one step further, by the way. Uh, those who are in accounting and uh, want to pursue careers in accounting, CPAs do that. Okay? CPAs can be an accommodator as well. Oh, that's good to know. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah. How many here uh, accounting uh, majors and accounting? One, okay, got it. Two, three, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is uh, you can add this uh, title to your resume. So this is something I highly recommend for you, accounting majors that look into becoming an accommodator or having a, in a company that, that that's what it, and by the way, the accommodator, that's what they specialize. They specialize in 1031 exchanges, by the way. Great question. Thank you, Carla. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's set up a table here as far as the uh, what happened in the market in 2021. Uh, this is the example I've been uh, telling you about. Are we able to remove that from the screen? The chat. Uh, you know what? Give it. It's fine. It's fine. I, I can still read. I can move it. Yeah. It, it's okay. So I can read it too. It's fine. So in 2021 and 2020, most of my clients, they were calling my office asking me, Edgar, you know what? Can you value my property? I hear the property values are going up so much. I'll give you an example. There's a property in uh, South Torrance. That I did a valuation in the beginning of 2021 for $1,350,000, $1.350. You know how, how much I sold that property? And keep in mind this property, I never raised rents and the income still the same. And the owner never upgraded the property, did any renovations because the interest rate went down, the value of the property went up because of those rates coming down. So that, that was a phenomenon that was happening in 2020, 2021. So the property, that property, I'm telling you that right now that I, I evaluated, I did a value of 1.35. I closed escrow a few months ago for 2 million 50. Can you believe that property appreciated over $650,000 in a year? I mean, think about that, right? For a moment, that's it's insane. Well, what was happening in the past, year and a half, two years, from 2000, 2000 2021, 2021, the, the value of appreciated exponential, you know? My business, I did so much volume, the volume last year and the year before, I got at least 50% more than what I usually do. So this client of mine, what he decided to do is, he sold four units, in South Torrance, 
high value of 1.35 and I close this for 2.050. 2, so that 2,050,000, I found in two replacement properties. So he purchased a property, Crestline, and another property in Granada Hills. So he diversified his portfolio. And he, he satisfied that 200% goal. So anyways, that, that's, that was my world in 2000, 2021. Now, this is what's happening as we speak. There's a correction in the market right now. But remember we talked about the, the, there's so much demand for rentals. So this is why a lot of my colleagues and investors are still bullish about the market because the demand for housing is still there. Keep in mind, I see over Los Angeles you know, over the past year, year and a half, there's a moratorium. Nobody can raise rents. Have you thought about what's going to happen after that expires? I mean, as a student, right? You don't want to hear that, right? Because you need to go rent. But imagine if you're an investor knowing that after the moratorium is over, you can start increasing rents. That's going to happen next year and, and on, onward, you know? So that's why a lot of investors are very bullish. And that already started happening in Orange County, by the way. You know, values have gone up exponentially. That example, 30, and this is 13.4%, that's an average, right? Some sub-markets are more than 20%, 30%, 40%. <laughs> when the property is vacant, you can raise rent as much as you want. But of course, if, the, if it's occupied, there's a rent control that you cannot go over 5% in California. Plus you apply the CPI, the inflation for the city. So some cities inflation are 1%, 2%, 3%. Like in Torrance is more than 3%. Like where my office is, where I own property myself, I can go up to 8%, 9% rent, rent raises. So the demand for housing is still there. So that, that's, that's what is the apartment market continues to benefit from high occupancy rates and rent growth. On all the properties that I have, I have no vacancies right now. And if I do, I already have somebody already right now because they keep calling my office. You have any rental? Rental? How many of you guys signed a one year lease where you at right now? One year lease? When does your lease expire? You. Uh, June 1st. You? Like in May 6th. May, June, how about you? Early August. Early August, so you, it was Early last year. 14 months. 14 months, how's that? I don't, I don't know, the apartment that we're at, it started in uh, June or July. Got it, it's nice, I'm more than 12 months, it's nice. How about you guys? Um, 14 months. Okay. So, I mean, okay. so we have May, uh, June, August. Anybody else? Uh, May. And you? Okay. So all of you guys signed like a one year, one year, two months leases, you know? So your lease is gonna expire. So right now we are in November. It's still have another half a year to go, right? So right now, it's amazing that you didn't know and anticipate, right? You didn't know what was gonna happen in the market, right? But I wanna tell you that's congratulations on you having that lease, by the way, you know? I can assure you if you go this month or next month, that lease rate that you're paying is not gonna be the same. I'll assure you of that. It's gonna be at least five to ten percent higher, you know. Go. What are you gonna say? Oh, no, yeah. Just... yeah, it's it's crazy, right? It so think about this as an investor, right? So I highly recommend to look what's happening in the marketplace today. Look what happened in the marketplace about a year, two years ago. Right now, you are in the in your lifetime, this moment in time is very unique because you this is a transitional period going on, you know, from 
having a market where prices were exponentially appreciating uh, at ridiculous prices, so high prices, where now it's correcting, the market's correcting now, you know? The prices are lowering, but not as much, you know? But it's still, it, there's a correction in the market that's going to happen for the next like year, couple of years more. You know? But you as an investor, you have to start evaluating that for the next cycle. So right now we're entering like a new cycle now. Mm -hmm. We ended that cycle. Uh, so in 2008, we had the recession, prices went up, went up again, went down and went up. And now we reached the highest level, which was last year, 2021. And now it's correcting again, but it's not gonna correct to the lowest level because of this reason right here, higher demand for rentals. So that's what's happening as we speak. Also, the other, uh, something else to evaluate, and I know we talked about last uh, discussion that we had on campus. Um, what is the difference between the market conditions today versus in 2008? The big difference is that lenders are more disciplined now versus before. Before, they were so flexible with approving loans. Now, if you want to get a loan, you really have to meet their criteria. So borrowers are more qualified. It's a major difference. You know? So the possibility of uh, the possibility of a loan going bad is less now because those borrowers are able to afford those payments. Generally speaking, so that's a major difference now, before and now. Mm -hmm. This is a case study here. The bottom line here is that is that my uh, my client owned for the past thirty years four units here in Westchester, just down the street from campus, and uh, he saw what was happening in the market: prices going up. So this is what he decided to do. This was a relinquished property. Four units. Three other units were two bedrooms, and one unit was a one bedroom. We sold that one for 1.5. His cap rate at that time, 4.75. So the loan that he had was 240,000 at 6.5%. 30 year fix. So he didn't have an, uh, uh, an arm loan, he was a fixed rate loan that he got. So the money, the 1.5, I sold this building by the way. This property, sales cost 124 and the balance 240. So he had cash 1.186. Cash not subject to capital gains, so we sold company one. So that example we talked about before, this is the relinquished property. No, we're talking about relinquished property. So I sold this building to an, another investor. As a matter of fact, I sold this building, this property, these four units, <laughs> to the owner next door. The owner of the property here in the, you cannot see this building here. He bought this property. You know the reason why he bought this property? because he needed this building so he can build 20 unit property. Actually, it's in the process right now. He put, set up the plans already in the drawings in the city so he can uh, be approved for 20 units. So that's another strategy that you have, you can have. You know, like if you can go acquire property to build, you know, so he's gonna demolish the property, that buyer of this relinquished property so he can build more units. Anyways, going back to my example, right? So this case study here, so I sold this four units. So 1.86. Do you guys think that I waited on day one to find replacement property? Not at all. I'm, I'm constantly looking for something, you know? So I already had two line up for them, for, for this client of mine, two properties. And keep in mind that my clients are open to, as long as it's, uh, they want to have assets close to home, 
not over, not out of state, you know. So I was able to find two properties for them for him. I found this property in Los Alamitos, Orange County, four units. Look at the unit mix. How many bedrooms? Four units, two bedrooms. And we saw, what did we sell? So we saw, let's look at the previous one. How much was the unit mix? Three, two bedrooms, and one, one bedroom. Right. So he had three, two bedroom. Not bad, right? Not bad at all, right? But look what he did here, how he diversified his portfolio. Remember one of the benefits we talked about? Better unit mix. So this is what he purchased. Four, two bedrooms. And this is, this unit here, this is our townhouse style. Two units here in the front, one on the back, the three bedroom here on the lower, and a three bedroom on the, on the upper level, plus garages in the back. Plus this location is a, just a little bit better location. Plus this building is a little bit newer as well. Look at his cap rate, 5.5. He just raised the rents about a month ago. Actually, his rents are gonna go up on December 1st. What's gonna happen to the cap rate when he raised the rent? Goes up, right? Correlation, right? Income, cap rate goal. 5.5. Down payment, 480. So he didn't use all the money. Look at strategy, right? How much money they, he had in the bank with the accommodator before? 1.186. So you see what he did? He didn't use all that money just for one property. 480. So he still has some money left, right? And by the way, this is uh, me as a broker, I start thinking about the more transactions I make, you make more money, right? More commission for me, right? But also at the same time, I want my client also to benefit, right? To increase his cash flow, you know? So that's how my mind thinks, right? If somebody's going to do a 1031 exchange, just make sure he's going to expand his portfolio, not just by one. See if we can buy maybe two buildings, maybe three. On this situation, he was able to buy two. Carla, you may want to listen to this one online. That's the second property that we bought, that he bought actually, in San Pedro. Down payment, 706. He got three, Two bedrooms. And by the way, these units are humongous units. I had to do a walk through all this property right, when I'm in escrow. So I, I, I have it in the back of my mind how they look. These units are, are humongous. They're more than like 1,300 square foot footage, the unit. They're, they're, they're big. Why is that important? Because I know that the rents, the potential to increase the rents is very good in the future. And this family that live there, they're not gonna move out anytime soon. That was my, I was wondering that, and that's why he put more money down on this one than he did on the other. You got it, exactly right. This is his legacy building. He's not gonna be selling this property anytime soon. Of course, unless I find something better for him, but, but this transaction that he did is, is excellent, by the way, because the units are large units. So he believe in this building, so remember the three property rule? This one, he satisfied the 200% rule, by the way, on this one. Unit mix, right? Three, two bedrooms. Three, three units, two, three bedrooms, and one, bed, one, two bed, one, one, two bedroom. Let me see. Uh, yeah, the two bedrooms right here in the front. In the front. The other ones have three bedrooms. Oh, it has garages also in the back. And the location here is excellent. This isn't a great, by the way. This is this is this is something that is doable. This is real life. This is something that I do for a living. I do this on a daily basis. I find property for my clients. If you ever want to have a career in brokerage, that's what you can do. 
if you want to become a, an investor, entry level, sophisticated, medium sized level uh, investor, this is this is one 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 stepping stone. You know, this is an example, real life example that something that you can do. Here's a scenario of this uh, case study here. So we have seven benefits, right? We, we identify better location, newer buildings, more units, better mix, improved cash flow, more fair market, market value. Look at this. His value went up $750,000 by making this transaction right away, market value. And having more debt, now he has more, more cash flow. Just by, uh, I'm gonna do a little poll here in the class. And uh, let's see. If you have to pick one of the seven, which one would you think that is uh, priority number one? Okay, let's go here. If you have to uh, seven. Five. Cash flow. Cash flow. Why? You want to make sure it's not costing you money. <laughs> Say it again. You want to make sure it's um, making you money and not costing you money. What does that mean, costing you money? Like you have to put out more money than you That's right. I mean, if you have to make that transaction, that makes sense, right? I agree with you. What about you? I would say cash flow a little bit. I believe cash flow is more important. Why? Because, you know, with 1031, you're going to get better things. Avoiding tax, you're right, but what a way to put it. Also, like, cash flow is the main source of revenue because whenever it's selling the property, yeah, I agree with you. It, isn't it amazing that uh, sometimes, as an investor, some investor, and I, you cannot actually identify what kind of investor you are. That better location is not that important. It is important, but for you guys, first thing into your mind is cash flow, right? If you're gonna go through all this process. You want to increase your cash flow, more income coming into the property. You know, I agree with you. 100%, not like 99, but 100%. <laughs> okay, uh, in the back, which one would you pick? What do you think is uh, important, cash flow or how the property looks? Or maybe the location, you know, better, better in a mix, perhaps, or to increase your, your, your fair market value? More money coming in or the property to look nice in a good location? Both? Okay. So let's say uh, we can say that it's a better location. Okay. And then cash flow. How about you? Cash flow. Cash flow? Okay. Ladies person on the right side. Say it again. Cash flow. Cash flow. Why? Because like everyone else is saying that's like the main point in in doing these deals is that to increase your cash flow. That's it. You? Um, I guess cash flow as well. Cash flow. Thank you. I think location, if you think that location has a really good potential for increasing in value, like if it's a location you think five, ten years from now, it could be a really big hot spot in the market, then it could create longer growth in the future. There's, there's a huge correlation. You, 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 you're correct. I'm going to tell you, go to one area, you have more cash, I mean, more cash flow because that property is in a prime location versus the other. You're right. We have like one more minute left and uh, 
I just want to share with you that I really enjoy being here, talking to you guys. Please reach out to me anytime, you know. And to conclude, this is uh, this is excellent about uh, your analysis and your answers that you have here. I think that's, I agree with everything you said. Cash flow is number one, location is number two. Everything else will fall into it, you know? All the other seven benefits. If you ever wanna learn more about my model, the benefits and learn more about it, reach out to me anytime and I can send you a, a link. I can send you a, a, some information about it. And uh, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you.